episode 199 of CPP Cast with guest David Vandervoord, recorded May 23rd, 2019. Sponsor of this episode of CPP Cast is the PVS Studio team. The team promotes regular usage of static code analysis and the PVS Studio static analysis tool. And by JetBrains, maker of intelligent development tools to simplify your challenging tasks and automate the routine ones. JetBrains is offering a 25% discount for an individual license on the C++ tool of your choice, C-Lion, ReSharper, C++, or AppCode. Use the coupon code JetBrains for CPPCast during checkout at JetBrains.com. In this episode, we discuss undefined behavior. Then we talk to David Vandervoort from the Edison Design Group. David talks to us about his contributions to C++ and recent work on Constexper evaluation. Welcome to episode 199 of CVP Cast, the first podcast for C++ developers by C++ developers. I'm your host, Rob Burving, joined by my co-host, Jason Turner. Jason, how's it going in Israel? That's great. I, we just had a really good uh, Core C++ conference last week and awesome. technically my second keynote ever, so it was super fun from that regard. And uh, yeah, yeah it, was a, it was a really good conference and they they sold out, as we mentioned before. And so, yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah. And then, uh, doing some touring around, uh, after that. Very cool. And did they record all those sessions? Those going to be on YouTube eventually, you know, they were all professionally recorded and I believe they're starting to piece that stuff together right now. I don't know what the schedule is. Awesome. Well, once we, uh, see those go up, we'll have to let listeners know. Yeah. Okay. Well, at the top of every episode, I'd like to read a piece of feedback. Uh, this week, I got an email um, from Professor Daniel Garcia, who is an associate professor in uh, in Spain. I can't read the, <laughs> the name of the university. Um, but here it's in, hey, Jason and Rob, thanks uh, for the huge job with CPPCast. I think you're doing a great job to make C++ developers feel like they're part of a community. Uh, I'm writing to you to call your attention to the last C++ conference we had in Spain, uh, which is called Using Stood CPP. We have six editions of the conference now, and he recently wrote a trip report with data gathered um, from the evaluation forms, um, and he shared it, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes. And yeah, it was just a little collection of data they made from the attendees at this uh, Spanish C++ conference about what industries people were working on, what version of C++, what compilers and IDEs they were using. So yeah, some interesting stuff in there. They I had I had moved towards more uh, C plus plus eleven fourteen seventeen. That's awesome. I had no idea that there was a conference in Spain at all. Yeah, I had not heard of the Spain conference myself either. So if you are anywhere near Madrid, it looks like it's located in Madrid, but they have people coming from other parts of Spain too to attend. Well, and Conan's even one of the sponsors, which means our friend mm-hmm. Diego probably goes there. And yeah, I was looking at who. The talks were, and they had um, our recent guest, Di- Guy Davidson, doing one of the talks as well. How come none of our guests have <laughs> ever mentioned this? I don't know how we haven't heard about it before, yeah. Huh. Well, I'm offended. We know about it now. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show. Uh, you can always reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email us at feedback at cpcast.com. And don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes or subscribe to us on YouTube. Joining us today is David Vandevoort. David is a Belgian computer scientist who lives near Princeton. He is vice president of engineering at the Edison Design Group, where he contributes primarily to the implementation of their C++ compiler front end. He's an active member of the C++ standardization committee, where he is primarily active in the core language evaluation work. His recent work in the context has primarily been about extending the capabilities of context for evaluation. David is also one of five members of the committee's direction group. He is the primary author of the well-regarded C++ templates, a complete guide David, welcome to the show. Hey, hi. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Now, we've mentioned the uh, direction group a couple of times here. Can you remind us what that does? 
Yeah, so there, a few years ago, a number of um, national body representatives and, and, and some experts uh, got together because they felt um, there was often some conflict and uh, we, the committee didn't seem to always be um, going in a single direction when it came to the evolution of the language. So they wondered if it would be nice to have a group of people who have been with the committee for a while, uh, have different interests, and see if they can agree on the general direction and express that in some way. And then they would use that as, uh, you know, one one element of guidance into in, in decisions that are made in the future. And so we they put up they put together a group of five people. Uh, Bjarne Strusser obviously is, um, is in that group, having the longest history with the language. Um, <laughs> Uh, Beeman Dawes was in that group. He he retired, so he he's the first retiree of that group. But uh, Beeman, um, we we can thank him for having uh, the standard template library integrated in the standard, among other things. Um, um, Michael uh, Wong, who's uh, representing all kinds of activities in the committee. Uh, Howard Hinnant, you you probably know him. Uh, we have to thank him, among other things, for uh, move semantics. Um, Roger Orr is now in this, in this group as well. He's a British representative, has been on the committee for, I think, close to 20 years. Um, he's, uh, he's also the chair of BSI, um, and helps organize the, um, the ACCU, uh, meetings. Um, and then myself. Cool. So, and so we, 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 we're having a regular calls, uh, conference calls among the five of us and just discuss, um, topical issues about standardization. And there is a paper, I think it's a P0... I think it's P0939 or P0959 um, that that we update with sort of general generalities about where we think C++ should should go in the short term, medium term, and long term. So that's a paper that gets republished with each committee meeting. Not not every meeting per se, but we try to to have updates uh, every few meetings. I think there've been so far there've been three versions. I think. Okay. What are in some of the like recent points coming out of that paper? Anything um, particularly interesting? Well, they're interesting if you're into the standardization, I'm sure. Okay. Uh, wow. and, and a lot of them are, are very general. We don't try to we don't try to give direction about here's how you should do this. Right? It's more general principles, but also about certain topics. For example, uh, one of the things we 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 considered was we, we think it's important f- uh, for to take into account education when we design a feature. You know, how how is this going to be taught? And in fact, out of this discussion came a new study group within the community called uh, SG20 which is focused on, on education. It's maybe something we don't think about when we think about how to evolve the language, but it's, it's, uh, it's really important if we want to not just carry along people who have, done, who have been using this language for 20 years, but, but getting new generations to, um, to becoming experts. Right. Okay. Well, David, we got a couple news articles to discuss. Uh, feel free to comment on any of these, and then we'll start talking more about uh, your work with the committee and some of the recent proposals you're working on. Okay. So, sounds good. Uh, by, by the way, I, I heard you mention there the the, the, the meeting in Spain. Uh, the person who sent you that mail is uh, uh, Jose da- Daniel Garcia. He's actually the representative of Spain on the committee meeting. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, and he's heavily involved, among other things, in uh, contracts. Oh, Very cool. Okay, so this first article we have is uh, Exploring Undefined Behavior Using Constexper. And this is from, I'm probably not going to pronounce this right, Jason, I think you know his name, Shafiq Yagmur. Is that right? Uh, I know it's Shafiq. <laughs> okay. Uh, but this is a pretty interesting uh, article. He's basically going over how because Constexper expressions don't allow undefined behavior, kind of using it as a way to, to test your code and make sure you're not going to encounter undefined behavior. And he's going through a bunch of examples and talking about using it in uh, Compiler Explorer to quickly uh, check your code for, for UB. And, of course, you have to const expert all the things if you actually want to be able to do that. Right. And there's actually some, you know, you, you get some sometimes really nice diagnostics from that. I, I recently implemented a dynamic allocation in const expert. And if you have a leak, not only does it tell you where, uh, you know, that there is a leak, but it'll tell you exactly where it leaked, you know, hmm. oh, because nice. we have to, ca- we have to catch all undefined behavior. It's, uh, you know, the, the context per machine is the ideal C++ machine. So I mean, is that... ide- ideal from an abstract point of view, you, you don't necessarily like it because sometimes you want undefined behavior or, or something on a little bit on the edge. <laughs> so is that for the EDG uh, front end that you did that or? Yeah, yeah, yeah yes, that's correct. Okay. And uh, I, this is going a bit off topic, sorry, but I must ask, uh, where, how is the EDG front end used today? 
I can't give you a complete answer to that because uh, a lot of our customers don't want to know that their technology is actually our technology. I see. Uh, but, but if you were to use um, a Visual Studio's IntelliSense, for example, uh, that is based on ours. I can say that because they put it on the blog post. Right. Um, the Intel compiler, um, we are. They have admitted that we they use our our front end. Um, this uh, I think Coverity. If you if you know Coverity, they have a mm -hmm. source analysis tools. They, they yeah. have a paper a paper where they also mentioned that they use our our front end as a as a thing that that processes everything. Uh, but there's there's lots of other customers. Um, a lot of um, embedded systems compilers, especially in in Asia. Uh, okay. use, use our technology use our technology and you also have your own back end no well we we write the front end and most of our customers are really only un, uh, interested in that right and they, they, okay. they use that then we, we, we represent the um, the program as a graph we can lower that to a level where the graph is more or less c semantics it's not exactly c semantics but it's the kind of stuff that you expect from c and not necessarily c plus so so something like a virtual call will then be replaced by a, an indirection to a, a virtual function table. Okay. Uh, and our customers, a lot of our customers use that, some don't. And then we have a backend called a, a C generating backend, which we use for testing purposes. So we generate C so we can compile it with another compiler like Lang or GCC or Microsoft and just to test our output. Uh, not a lot of people use that. Uh, you might remember the Como compiler from 10 years ago. It was, it, it was a relatively inexpensive advanced compiler, and he, uh, Como was using was was using that module. But I don't think a lot of our customers do otherwise. We also okay. actually have a, a C plus plus generating module where if you don't lower the representation, you can regenerate C plus plus code, and then you can what you can do is um, tweak the graph representing the program, and then having equivalent C plus plus code regenerated. Um, interesting. It's actually really of, interesting. So a lot of our customers use that to uh, to instrument your code. So they, they they build tools, not necessarily compilers, but tools that will insert stuff in your code, and then they produce C++ output that's compatible with the actual build compiler you use. Wow. Okay. Yeah, we we actually emulate most of the major compilers and all of their versions. So if you if you're if you're building with say G++ 4.8.3, we will emulate that version for you. Wow. And so at what stage then uh, I, I, we're really going off the rails from the news <laughs> <at> the <moment. laughs> sorry about that but uh, so I, I just have to dig in a little bit since you said you just implemented const expert dynamic allocation and is that uh something that has been officially accepted for c plus plus 20 and i'm curious where and at what point in your edg code like does the front end catch that that's an or how does that work all right, so it's not officially in C plus plus twenty yet, or, okay. or even or even in the working draft. It has passed uh, evolution. So the um, the evolution working group has agreed that this is something that that should go forward, and they have handed it over to uh, the core working group. So they are now working on revising the words that my friends and I have written to make that possible. Uh, and in fact, I, I, ha I have to update that for the next meeting. Then hopefully in Cologne in uh, July, um, core core being the core working group will will agree that these are the right words or, or bring them into a shape where they're they're correct and then this, the committee will vote that in okay um, and yes and yes it's completely handled in the front end so everything that's const expert is is handled in the front end yeah i've never really like stopped to think about who has to actually execute the const expert on the abstract machine but clearly that's not i guess that's that can't happen on the back end right it um the results of it have to come back to the front end because, for example, it could be a template argument, right? It's a call into a right. So, so maybe you could work together with your backend, but that that violates some engineering principles, right? You you you're trying to separate uh, uh, concerns here. Okay. So, so typically, it's not done that way. And in fact, today's implementation of uh, constexpr are are still suffering from a lot of legacy, uh, and so they don't really even ha they. They're built not just in the front end, but using really old technology in the front end, like the, in, in most cases, with a few exceptions. Uh, so you'll find that it's not as performant as you as you might hope for. They'll improve over time, but it'll take a while. Okay. Okay. Uh, and we can we can talk about that later uh, if you want to talk about. Uh, I mentioned this in the C plus now talk I gave a few weeks ago. Right. I will. Uh, we will get back to that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, next article we have is uh, an update from the Visual Studio blog. And this one is all about um, updates to their uh, Linux support. So one thing is that you can now directly target the Windows subsystem for Linux. And I think they have a full blog post just talking about that. Um, but then they also have announced that they have built-in support for um, the, using the address sanitizer, ASAN, 
and you can now um, separate your build and debug targets. So you can build on one Linux machine and then debug it on some like embedded machine, for instance, for example. Well, Visual Studio is going to be used for everything, or at least they want us to use it for everything. That certainly seems to be the goal. Yeah. Okay. And then next thing we have is uh, ENTT version three is out. And I don't think I've ever heard about this library before, but it um, seems to be pretty popular. It's used by Minecraft and the ArcGIS SDK and several other um, v- games. And it's a entity component system, which I think we've maybe heard about a couple times in the show when talking about with uh, game developers using that type we of pattern. Have. Yeah. And I think I just realized if that NTT entity entity mm-hmm. ah yeah I see what they did there. <laughs> <laughs> clever clever uh yeah but they you know in the last couple of changes they have uh C plus plus seventeen support and some built in reflection um and they made some memory optimizations I don't know is there anything else you want to point out with this one Jason I uh, no no there's nothing that I I need to add to this one okay. Uh, and then the last thing is uh, announcing C++ now 2020, uh, which, what did they give us the actual date for this in the announcement or just saying that there's going to be a C++ now 2020? Uh, I don't see a date. Oh, wait, no, May 3rd to 8th, 2020. There yes. We go. But they're also announcing um, all the best session winners from the 2019 conference. And uh, it seems like uh, Connor Hoxtra, who we had about a year ago talking about competitive coding i believe seems uh, to like really uh run the table he win almost every single award really yeah yeah that's yeah that's pretty crazy best presentation best speaker best news speaker most educational most engaging yeah the only one he didn't get was most inspiring which went to uh david sankel who we just had on and unfortunately i don't believe the keynotes are eligible for awards oh okay did you get a chance David. to? I'm sorry. Did you get a chance to go to Connor's uh, presentation, David? Uh, actually, actually, I didn't, but I met him there, and I, I can totally believe that uh, that he would he would do really well because he's, he's an engaging person, just in a person to person situation. And when we went out for dinner a few times with him in, in group setting, he he was really great. Uh, so I I can imagine he he'd be a great speaker. Yeah, it's always like super disappointing at C++ now when you. You went to all the sessions that you thought you wanted to go to, and then you find out that one session won like 10 awards, and it wasn't the one that you chose to go to. <laughs> You're like, yeah, no. Yeah, when, when, I, when I saw the awards, I'm like, gosh, you know, I should have, should have made an extra effort. Uh, one, one of the things that's exciting when, you're, when you go to this conference is you meet like-minded people. And, uh, you know, I, I promise myself to go to various talks, but then I get, I get stuck in a really great conversation or even a a session where we're coding so I, I spent some time with one person working on uh, on basically uh doing concept for stuff and uh and, and working out uh, the new the new reflection uh, apis and trying to implement some of that uh and then just I, I i got so into it that i forgot to go like to two three consecutive <laughs> talks <laughs> I, I spent most of my time actually in hallways like chatting with people and, and trying to get things to work yeah. Uh, but it's it's a it's a great venue, and uh, the people there are, you know, they're, they're knowledgeable. They're excited. They're excited about what they're they're doing. It's it's very inspiring uh, conference. I think. Was it? Have you been before? I went in 2012. I think that was the first edition that was C plus now as opposed to uh, BoostCon. Right. Uh, for a, a, a keynote on modules. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, and Jason, you had some other conference news. Yeah, I, we've been remiss uh, talking about some of these things, but I believe, I mean, uh, let's see, CppCon's call for submissions just ended. Right. But they now have their call for volunteers out, so mm-hmm. that needs to be checked out. And meeting C++ 2019, do they currently still have their call for submissions open? Let's see. That opened April 24th. April 24th. Um, Yes, and uh, uh, it's oh, you're able to edit until June 10th. When does it actually close? Might be June 10th. But there's that. I mean, there's this like so many conference things happening right now. We've done a terrible job <laughs> of actually announcing when all of the calls for submissions and that kind of thing were going on. It, right? It, it's harder to do because there's just so many now. Yeah, but we should be better about it. So the, of, of the things that I know people need to check out right now is the call for volunteers for CPPCon. Absolutely. Right. You gonna try to make it to uh, CppCon this year, David? You know, I've never been to a CppCon. Uh, uh, 
I've, I've been asked to uh, to attend, but um, it, we're we're a small company and uh, there's so much work. You know, even for C plus C++ now, I, I I wanted to go all week, but I had to I had to come back early. Um, so I think I won't go this year, but but I'm hoping to to go some year. I I certainly, I, I certainly have the green light for my for my employer. They, they, they let me go. I got an email this week saying, you know, would you like to go? I said, yeah, I'd like to go. But here, here's the thing we have to do between now and then. You know? <laughs> uh, and my family does want me a little bit around also. So there's that. Considering it's so, like a 20 minute drive from my house, I'm morally obligated to be there, I think. Uh, oh, all right. It's in, uh, it's in Colorado this year, right? Yes. All right. Yeah, but but I'm really glad to see so much activity in the community. There's there's conferences everywhere: That's, uh, Ru- Russia, Australia, New Zealand, uh, South Africa. Uh, oh yeah, that reminds me. Code Dive currently has their coast call for submissions open as well. <laughs> That's uh, Poland, Wrocław, November. Yeah, it's certainly great to see all these C plus plus conferences springing up just all over the world. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we, see, we, we little by little, some of these people trickle into the committee process. You know, not necessarily in person, but we get. We get uh, submissions and proposals, uh, participation in the reflectors um, community. I f- we feel like the community has gotten broader than it used to be. Yeah, very good. So I, I was just recently doing some research on the history of various features in C++11 or whatever. And, and I know I saw your name on many papers that came up. But if you can just like broadly give our listeners an overview of what papers in the development of C++11, maybe 1417, whatever, whatever you would like to highlight that you have been involved in. Oh, I probably don't remember, don't remember it all. And um, also the sort of the evolution process of language has changed over time. And um, like I remember in the beginning days of uh, C++ OX, the way right. it worked is that we all got into a room and we just brainstormed who wants what feature. And we put all that list, all, all the lists on the board. And then over the next few days, we'd sketch out how it would work. Right, so things like decal type, auto, um, and a number of, of the smaller features in C++11 were designed that way. And so my name might be on it, but it's really sort of a collective um, uh, uh, effort. Uh, okay. wh- one of them that I'm, it's a very small thing I did, but I'm perhaps most proud of in C++ is I wrote the wording needed for, to, uh, to allow you to put two angle brackets next to each other without a space in between. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you have a program with C++ without that. Uh, yes. But but it used to be you you had to put that space there, and the reason why is that it, it doesn't really fit in the in the in the clean compiler structure uh, to treat two angle brackets as sometimes a single token and sometimes two tokens. So so, so we call it the Lexa hack. And since the mid '90s, the committee had, had talked about well, you know, we should mandate the Lexa hack, uh, but mm. it didn't really fit in the specification. How do you specify such a thing? And so I, I wrote the specification. It's not very long, but what I liked the best about it, and and so did the core group who reviewed it, is that I made it look very innocuous in the in the working paper. So instead of saying you know describing a big a big hack somewhere in in, in the paper, it says no. It says similarly, if this happens, you just treat it as two two tokens, right? And it doesn't re- it doesn't really say very much about how you do that, but it's 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 clear enough that uh, that it, that it worked, uh, and it and it has a a, a huge impact in day to day life. Right, in day-to-day programming, perhaps more so than, than some of the, uh, the bigger features I've worked on. Um, an interesting one that I've uh, I actually started the modules work in, in the committee. Uh, oh, wow. Which, so the first iterations of that paper were for me, and then were uh, Doug Greger, uh, which uh, I assume you know, he, Doug, Doug contributed a lot of features to C++11, including variadic templates and right. the first uh, the first template concepts. Uh, so he, he, he took over and... Um, and uh, brought that to Clang. So the Clang modules are an outgrowth of, of his early work in Clang to try to implement modules. And then uh, Ga- Ga- Gabriel Dosreis, Gabby, mm-hmm. um, took over from, from Doug when Doug uh, went to work on Swift. And Richard Smith, the editor, also participated heavily in that. But uh, that whole process actually came out of um, a reflection proposal that I made. Oh. <laughs> so there, there, there is a paper, I don't remember the number, but it's... Um, it, it proposed a complete framework for uh, something like Consexpo functions, but it was called metacode functions, uh, a, a, a reflection library, and an actual meta programming library. And it, was, it was just a slide. It was not a, really a paper. I mean, it's, it's a PDF document that you can find on wt21.link. Uh, but uh, I, I was implementing all that stuff and 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 uh, designing it, 
um, I was thinking to myself, oh my gosh, all this stuff has to go in header files. These header files are going to be huge with reflection code. I need, I need some way to package that. We can't just keep on working, working uh, the way we're doing. And so I ended up uh, saying, well, I'll just design modules for that. And so I made a separate proposal for modules. Now, meanwhile, modules are in the language, uh, but we're still working on reflection. Uh, Gabby did get this context for though, so we're, we got that part done. Are you involved in the current reflection proposals? Yes, yes. Uh, in fact, um, there are two competing proposals at this point. Uh, one is ours, is uh, paper P1240. So if you go to wg21.link slash P1240, you'll get uh, an early draft of our proposal. Uh, and I do that work with uh, Andrew Sutton, who is the person who got us concepts in the language. Right. And uh, and also Faisal Valley, uh, who is the person who got us generic lambdas and context for lambdas in language. Um, and um, it's a fairly fleshed out proposal with an implementation, actually almost two implementations at this point. Uh, the other proposal is um, is by David Sankel, Alex Noman, and uh, Matusz Czoczlik. Uh, mm-hmm. You had Dave, David a few weeks on a yeah. ago on. And uh, that proposal... Um, it's it's more of a sort of a it's a little bit I don't know how to describe it. it's based on the TS it's, it's sort of a translation of the TS how would I take the TS as it is and translate it to um, the context per world um, and it's it's more so it says here's how you would do that it doesn't actually give uh, a full API or anything like that um, and so I don't think there's any implementation so far uh, but they're, they're competing they they they're a little bit different in their approach and, and sort of the scope of what they're trying to do. And that's off the table for C++ 20, probably, right? Yeah, it's not even clear we will have it for C++ 23 at this point. Really? Mm. Uh, um, I don't think uh, many of our listeners, they didn't want to hear that. You can just, <laughs> like, just say that. Uh, well, you know, we're still, a- we're still aiming for that, right? And sure. uh, so, so the direction group, I think, is unanimous that this is a something we should pursue. Uh, but... Um, from my experience, you know, when you when you have uh, competing proposals, there's going to be some time needed to to flesh out how you know how we're going to merge them or which one we'll take or right. you know what. that takes some time. And when you're done with that, there's still some work, quite a bit of work needed to to just make it really robust and have a spec that you can rely on. Um, if you think about how long modules took, which also had competing proposals, or how long concepts took, also competing proposals, they were both uh, 15 years and more. Uh, so. <laughs> You know, um, we'll see. Yeah. Um, yeah. Th- I've never heard anyone quite put it that way, that it was more than 15 years uh, in total. And that's... Well, I think I think my original modules paper was 2004. Right. That, with, that's with, not with, on schedule, with, yeah. Yeah. So, and we just put them in 2019, so that's 15 years. Yeah. And uh, uh, when was the original... Uh, concepts proposal do you know that's been a long time going well well concepts were already described in uh, the uh, design and evolution of c++ the the book of bjarni which uh-huh. was published in 1994 okay um so i'm not sure if that counts as a paper but it certainly and, and he had been thinking about it before i think in fact you know what uh, the first paper describing templates was a um, was actually a conference paper in 87 and i believe it already had a little bit of a sketch for for a concepts like feature Wow. Okay, so now I have, uh, since you just said you knew like exactly when that paper was published or whatever, like I, when I was doing my research into the history of C++ recently, I had a hard time finding specific papers pre-C++11. Yeah, Is yeah. that all publicly available information for people who are curious? Uh, it, it's probably publicly available, but it's not necessarily available online. Okay. So you, have to, you have to go to, um, you know, university libraries and so on. Oh, and get back when they actually used to print these things out before standards meetings. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I have. A, I don't know if I still have. I probably have somewhere at home still one or two mailings, which are these, literally these stacks of paper. <laughs> <laughs> wow. When the when, when, when the mailman brought it, he couldn't fit it in a mailbox. It would have to ring, and it was, it was quite something. Uh, and also, you know, you'd go to proceedings like the, 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 um, the, the templates paper where where Bjarni proposed templates at first was. Um, Unix conference in Colorado. So if you oh. go to the, proce- to the proceedings of the Unix conference of uh, 1987, uh, you would probably find that paper. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I, I am interested in that. I don't know if I'm that interested to do that much digging, but... You could, you could try to send a mail uh, to Bjarne and see if you can get a copy. <laughs> he, 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 I, I'm not sure if he has a 
a copy handily available. Right. Would be a possibility. Right. Okay. So of all the things that you've been involved in that have now been accepted in the language, do you have, I, I, I want to ask if you have any regrets, is there anything that you would have done differently in hindsight? Um, yeah, probably. Um, <laughs> 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 uh, now, I have regrets about certain things where I don't necessarily regret the choices. I Well, first, I, I have to confess something. When I first came to the committee, uh, the export wars raged on. So people were fighting about uh, where the templates should be. You should be able to instantiate a template in another translation unit from okay. a current translation unit. And that there, there was a feature called export the templates that came out of that in uh, C++ 98. And the fights about that or, or the discussions uh, were, were very active when I first started attending the committee. And I was, I was a young student. And I thought it was very exciting. All these people saying great things. And that feature just looked awesome to me. And so, so I, I supported it. Uh -huh. right? and, and so I, I regret having supported it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, karma, as karma would have it, I had to implement it years later. So, so I think justice, you know, I've, I've paid my, my dues for, for that mistake. Um, I'm, uh, I'm not very happy with, um, class template argument deduction. And I did participate oh. in, uh, uh, I did part participate in that. Um, Max Burns and I started off with a, a proposal for that. And, uh, that proposal was terrible. I, I, I did a, a poor job thinking it through. Uh, but the core, the core working group, you know, immediately found the, the problems with it. And Richard Smith then came up with this great idea of um, uh, deduction guides, right? So you're, you're probably familiar with C++17 deduction guides, which are function-like things that describe how you should deduce something from an initializer. And that is, a, that is just an awesome, an awesome way of thinking about it, and I love deduction guides. But then uh, a couple of things were added on, to, on top of that. One is that you sort of have implicit deduction guides, and I, I personally think those are a mistake. And also we made a special case for... Um, for the singleton case, so if you if you if you say a vector v and you you say you know equals braces and a single element in there, that's mm -hmm. treated differently than if you have zero, two, or more elements. And that's, okay. I, I I really think that's unfortunate because it makes generic code just you know basically class template argument deduction or CTAD. Um, you you have to be careful when you deal with uh, with generic code, especially with okay. uh, things like. Um, uh, what you call a pack expansion, right? So, say so you have a, an initializer that has a pack expansion in it. Yeah. Uh, th that might not do what you what you think it will uh, with CTAD. So, right. what actually? I'm not familiar with that issue. What happens if you do pass a single element to a vector expecting CTAD? Well, it will it will prefer uh, treating it as a copy rather than as uh, a single element for the vector. So, instead of say say you you, you have a vector v equals open brace. Uh, an element as type vector of int close brace. Okay. Right? It will see that as an attempt to copy vector of int, and so deduce the other thing also as vector of int instead of making it a vector of vector of int. Okay, interesting. Right? And so the decision that decision was made because the expectation that most of the time when you write this that kind of code, what you intend is a copy, and perhaps that's true. But because it's no longer because it's a special case, now you can no longer do this thing generically. You can now right you. If you put two Vs in there, then suddenly it does become a, a vector of vectors. Okay. Okay. I want to interrupt the discussion for just a moment to bring you a word from our sponsors. PVS Studio is a tool for detecting bugs and security weaknesses in the source code of programs written in C, C++, C Sharp, and Java. It works under 64-bit systems in Windows, Linux, and macOS environments, and can analyze source code intended for 32-bit, 64-bit, and embedded ARM platforms. The PVS Studio team writes a large number of articles on the analysis of well-known open source projects. These articles can be a great source of inspiration to improve your programming practices. By studying the error patterns, you can improve your company's coding standards, as well as adopt good programming practices which protect from typical errors. For example, you can stop being greedy on parentheses when writing complex expressions involving ternary operators. Subscribe to Facebook, Telegram, or Twitter to be informed about all publications by the PVS Studio team. Links are given in the podcast show notes for this episode. So uh, you recently gave a keynote at C++ Now um, about C++ constants. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about your keynote talk? Right. So um, I've been very involved lately in uh, extending the capabilities of uh, constexpr in the language. And the reason why I've done that is that uh, two years ago, um, I came to the group that does reflection. And I asked them to change direction because the, the direction they were going, which is the direction you'll find in TS, 
is that they represent everything using types and and uh, rely on template metaprogramming to do things. Now the problem with with that is, is it, it doesn't scale well at all. If if you don't template metaprogramming, you know that large programs just are very slow to compile and run out of memory. Uh, we can talk later about that if you if you're interested. But so I I, I came with a, I said well we should use constructor instead. And we should compute with actual values using code that looks just like C++. It'll be it'll, it'll be more efficient and it'll be easier. And uh, the group agreed with that, and so we changed direction. But when I presented that, I also said, well, we don't actually have the tools we need to be able to do that. We'll want uh, dynamic allocations. We'll want uh, uh, functions that are uh, guaranteed to be evaluated at compile time because we're doing compile time reflection. It'd be bad if suddenly you try to access your compile internals while you're running the program. It's just not possible. Uh, stuff like that. So. Uh, so in order to front load that work and not having to put everything in the, in the reflection group, I started separately uh, designing those features. Uh, and they're, they're now mostly accepted, uh, except for the dynamic allocation part. Um, so the organizer of C++ now thought that since I'd done that, I'd be a good person to talk about um, context per evaluation in general. And so I, made, I prepared this talk that has sort of three parts to it. Uh, one is give a... Um, a general background of what's the mental model to think of when you when you think of con constant evaluation in C++. Right? So what are the basic principles that the language uses and we should guide our uh, the evolution of the language going forward. Then the second was an overview of what we can do in C++20, what we will be able to do in C++20. And the third one was actually a, an analysis of the performance of constant uh, evaluation um, uh, today. And uh, okay. uh, you, you might be familiar with um, the abstraction penalty. Uh, there was a term that uh, Alex Stepanov introduced in the um, mid to late 90s, 97. He, he found out that when you compile code like the STL, um, you know, the STL was supposed to be as performant as handwritten code. And that was only true for very simple types. He found out that when you started composing things, you had to pay an abstraction penalty because the compiler couldn't optimize all the way through. Okay. Right. Now, okay. compilers have, impro have improved to most of the time you know, if you, you know, if you say have a vector of doubles uh, and you iterate with a pointer or you iterate with over it with a more abstract iterator and instead of a double, you have a class containing a double, Compile will nowadays usually see through that and give you exactly the same code at high, high optimization levels. The problem with Constexper is that optimization and running are both in the same budget, right? It's in your compile time budget. So there is no such thing as a zero abstraction penalty. Every time you add a little abstraction in your code, Right, in your context for code, you'll have to pay for it. Uh, but what's surprising mm -hmm. is just how much you have to pay for it in current implementations. Uh, so, so we looked at, we looked a little bit at um, at some of these things. So, I, I heard on Twitter that that same kind of question came up in Hannah's keynote with her compile time regular expressions about performance at compile time. So, what what hope do you see for that? Well, um, as I mentioned. Uh, uh, earlier when we started talking about constexpr, yeah. currently comp compiles are just trying to keep up with the language. Right? And so they implement stuff as quickly as they can within the framework that they have. So we've had a certain way of evaluating constants for 25 years and suddenly, suddenly comes constexpr and we're asked to do it differently. So certainly G++ and, and Microsoft and, and, and our front end at first just implemented on top of this old machinery which was not at all meant to scale that well. I think we'll, we'll little by little uh, refactor those things, re-engineer those things, and and uh, improve the performance. Um, in my company, we've already done uh, one important step towards that. So now we're like orders of magnitude faster. But I think there's still one or two orders of magnitude um, speed that's on the table that we'll, we'll probably get. So is it's it pos uh, it's possible that we'll get even optimizations, like sort of uh, the kind of stuff that people do with interpreted languages? But it's a little trickier for... for for the C++. I mean, C++ is not a language designed to be interpreted. Uh, so we'll, we'll see how that evolves. But I think we'll, we'll see things getting, getting better. They might get a little worse first as people add the other context for features, you know, things like uh, we'll see in C++ 20 add a little bit of a, of a cost to the implementation. Um, and, and one of the things you'll be able to do is have context for destructors. And that's probably a feature that you'll have to pay for even if you don't use it. Um, but uh, but it'll, it'll improve after that, I think. So just to be clear, context for destructors, not in C++20, but you see that probably coming. No, no, no. They will be in C20 if all goes well. They, they're part oh, of the, okay. they, they're part of the, the alloc dynamic allocation proposal because oh, okay. we'll, we'll be able to have vectors and strings in uh, Constexpr. 
so the so obviously the destructors have to be have to be able to uh, deallocate memory um, so that they'll probably be there. But the implementation of that is surprisingly difficult. Okay. Uh, uh, when I was just at Core C++, someone made a comment. I do not remember who it was. Not that I would necessarily say if I did that they saw a, a hypothetical future of const expert actually being compiled to like as in JS or something and then being run in a virtual machine and then taking that result back out. Is that? I. It's possible that we'll get something like that, but I'm not sure the balance of cost versus benefit will ever will ever reach there. Okay. Uh, and that's 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 a tricky part, right? As uh, you know, we have one budget with a compiled with a compiled budget. How much time do we want to spend just translating these functions into other formats, and and then running another optimizer on that and another backend? So I'm, I'm not sure. We'll we'll have to experiment and find out. Um, it's possible that like a JavaScript engine, there will, there will actually be several engines in a single product where you, you know, as long as it's not too hot, you'll use a a cheap to translate but slow to execute engine and then if it starts you know if the compiler starts uh discovering that it you know that you're running something a lot it will optimize that to another engine okay again the the, the problem here is most compiler teams are relatively relatively small we're we're just five people here in, in my company right um and so how much resources can you can you allocate to that while the language moves forward in other areas that is something uh that has struck me recently is if you if you sum up the number of people who are involved in standard library implementations and compiler implementations, I mean, it's great that we've got uh, three, four different competing implementations of the compilers because then we get to prove that these things are correct. But the actual total number of people involved in this around the world is shockingly few. It is. It really is few. And, and some of the lesser known compilers have amazingly efficient teams uh, i know of one c++ front end which is uh, i believe is now fully conforming to c++ 14 has one person developing it part-time <laughs> wow that is really impressive that's a person yeah. who uh earns their wages i guess i i, I hope so <laughs> uh, he, he comes to committee meetings he's is uh, not particularly vocal but he's he's a uh, you know he, he he knows his stuff and obviously he does fantastic work wow Apparently. So going back to uh, your keynote, you said the, the second part was on const eval and, and how we'd be using it in C20, I think. Do you want to go yeah, into that a little yeah. bit more? Uh, sure. I'll try to remember. <laughs> uh, so so it, was, it, was, it was basically going over all the ways we've, uh, we've relaxed and improved uh, const expert since it came in. Right? So in C14, we just did one ch- big change, which was instead of just having. Um, uh, a return statement in your context for functions, you could now have generally general functions. You could have statement uh, loops, variables, and so on. So that was a that was a big change. Then C plus seventeen added the uh, context for lambdas and uh, made a change also with respect to uh, template arguments. And C plus twenty will bring you a whole bunch of new stuff. One is const eval functions. So const eval function is like a context per function, but it's um, it's it has to produce a constant. If you don't get a constant, it'll get you an error. Right, so you won't get in a situation where you think that you wrote code that is cost you nothing because it's compiled at, at compile time, but in fact the compiler didn't didn't evaluate as a constant. Uh, this will this will avoid that problem. Um, there is um, an interesting new library function called uh, is constant evaluated. Yeah. It's actually a little tricky, but the way it works is say you have a, f- a function that does real tricky stuff to get the best performance you can at runtime. Maybe it runs uh, inline assembly. You can't have its context, but now you know of an algorithm that you could write using regular for loops and so on that would be context per uh, compatible, but it wouldn't optimize as well. Well, you can you can put an if statement that says, well, if you're if you're trying to evaluate this in a in a context where you need a constant, then just use this this for loop. You know, it's slower, but it's done at compile time, so you won't pay for it at runtime. Uh, but if if you're actually generating uh, runtime code, then use this other thing. Use this this tuned code that I have. Um, and we, we, among other things, wanted that to uh, to implement uh, to, to make string and vector available in context per evaluation. But I think it's it's, it's generally useful to a lot of people. Um, let's see what else do we have. You can now we, we've changed some rules about unions, so you can you can change the active member of a union during context per evaluation. Um, yeah, I'm probably uh, forgetting a few more, uh, but yeah, so so quite quite a few. Um, Extension, and of course, then the, the dynamic allocation. So you'll be able to uh, to dynamically allocate memory during context per evaluation, 
but you have to make sure everything is deallocated by the time you're done with the, with the computation. Uh, so leak is a, undefined behavior. It's not undefined behavior. It will it will make it non-constant. So you'll get an error. In, well, it'll basically say, sorry, that is not a constant. Okay. Uh, and if and if you try to do that in a in a in a context where you need a constant, you'll get an error. And uh, and my my implementation says, you know, it's an error. You didn't deallocate everything. Here's the first allocation that didn't deallocate. Uh, that wasn't deallocated. So it's it's fairly easy to track down. We actually had a scheme where you'd be able to allocate to have a uh, memory that's left over. And we would then promote that dynamically allocated memory to either uh, file scope memory, so a static allocation or aut automatic allocation. Um, so you could do something like a context per vector of int and have something uh, computed at compile time. And now you would have that vector actually be statically allocated in your program. Right. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, we ran into some problems with that late last year. We found a solution for it, but the committee didn't love the solution. So we're going to wait uh, until after C plus twenty to get that into the language. So C plus twenty, you have dynamic allocation, but you have to um, you have to clear it all up before you're done with the computation. Hopefully, we'll have dynamic allocation. Are you That's promising true. it? Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I can't promise it, but I have high hopes, and I'll I'll be sorely disappointed if we don't have. It. Okay. Are you going to make it to the next C plus committee meeting? Yes, I, I've okay. um, I've been attending since '96, and I think I've missed something like three meetings in, in the. Oh time. wow! Wow! All right, so. You were involved in the original modules proposal, you said, right? Mm -hmm. And you're doing all this work on const expressions and const uh, eval right now. And something I've been thinking about a lot lately is if we're doing more things at compile time that can be done at compile time, it seems to necessitate more things living in header files because yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That was and that seems also. what's that? Yeah, I was. I had the same thought. That's why I I, I started modules. Okay, uh, but it doesn't seem like modules helps that, right? Because we still have to have the definitions available in the header files for the things that are consuming the modules for the constant expressions, or am I missing something? Right, no, you are, I think you are missing. The, you can put the context for definition in the module, uh, in the module interface file, as it's called, and it will be pre-compiled, and then we'll, we'll just import the definitions as we need them. Uh, so, the, so we can uh, have header-only libraries that will benefit from modules effectively. Uh, absolutely. So, so the, I mean, instead of being header only, there will be module interface uh, only. But it's it's the same ID except it's pre-compiled and therefore it's faster. It's for faster to build. Oh, then I was absolutely missing something there. Now I am <laughs> looking forward to modules more than I was yet, an hour ago. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's the same with inline functions. You know, your inline functions can go there, and uh, you'll you get the benefits of easy inlining. You know, without relying on uh, link time optimization (LTO), right. um, uh, but and yet they're they're sort of pre-compiled, pre-compiled in the front-end sense. The back-end still has to, so we'll still have to spend time uh, optimizing everything you use. Do you think that that would then change the way that we write programs? Maybe we don't use header file C, or you know CPP file separation at all anymore. We just throw it all at the module and let the compiler do the right thing. Uh, uh, the public interface, that is. I'm not sure. Um, okay. I still think it's it's nice to have uh, a clean binary separation for uh, for engineering purposes. Uh, so I think we will still have the CPPs. I, I I do hope that header files will slowly disappear, but okay. they will never really disappear. We have too much of a legacy. Um, but here's an interesting thing I've I've been thinking about. So right now we have you know talking about modules. Uh, we, we, there's a lot of talk about how we're going to integrate that in our in our build systems. Right. right. So right now our build systems are a kind of computation that happens outside of your compiler, right? So using your tools, we're using makefiles, ninja, whatever you, you like to use, and your scripts and so on. But it's a lot of different, uh, different tools, not standardized. Uh, I find that very often when I get into a project, you know, I try to participate in it. The problem is not learning the source code. The problem is learning the build environment. I spend way more time on that than anything else. Well, we're currently also looking at... Um, and this is this is looking much much more ahead, but we're looking at things like side effects in Constexpert, right? How how about being able to read some files so you can process them and, and generate some some static data for yourself? Or how about oh, yes. being able to write some files? Well, I'm I'm fully about, on board with the reading, but the writing I'm still not sure about. <laughs> well, I, I implemented a few weeks ago in my in my compiler a a way to uh, to do some output, and it's really nice because if you want to debug your Constexpert functions, you know that's that's a great tool to have. Uh, but what if your build itself could be a context for evaluation? So instead of 
having these external tools, you would have a, a CPP file that imports a build tool library, and you would describe using, you know, race initializers or functions, however things are, are built, and you just say, compile this, that would kick off compiles of other things because Consexpo would give you access to, to the compiler. Right. And off we go. Everything is within within the language now, including your build process. Do you see a future where that happens? I am I am uh, gunning for a future where that happens. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been on the committee since 1996, and you're not tired of it yet, in other words. Um, I, lo- I love this. I love my work. <laughs> I, you know, I, 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 you know, I enjoy the language. the The people in this community I find are are they're they're generally friendly and they're always super interesting. Uh, the company I work for is you know a dream job. So yeah, um, I, I didn't think this was where I was going to la- land because I, I actually studied in in numerics. I thought I was going to you know design rockets or something. But I, I don't regret. Uh, I, I love this this work. For, I just for some reason expecting you to say that your degree was in horticulture or something, and you just landed <laughs> into this. <laughs> that, that, that would that would be really cool, but no. Yeah, that would actually be awesome. <laughs> you should change your backstory, and it's, <laughs> oh, my, my, it's my fine. Wife is, my wife is really good with plants. She has a she has a green thumb, but I, I don't think I can steal her her thumbs <laughs> though. <laughs> Okay, uh, I guess before we let you go, um, you talked so much about you know the history of different features you've worked on. Is there anything you would like to do? Like if you had a magic wand, something you would change, some feature to add or, or take away? Yeah, for sure. I already talked about uh, something I don't like about class template argument detection. Sure. Uh, I wish I could uh, change uh, the way we do initializers a little bit. Hmm. Uh, I would definitely like a linear declaration model for... Um, for the for just general declaration syntax, that's something I have we inherited. No idea what you mean. Well, so, so we inherited from C this this bizarre way of composing declarations, right? So okay. if, you, if you want a pointer to a function that returns a pointer to something else, it's really hard to teach to teach that to someone, mm, right? right? And yet it'd be so much nicer if you could just write pointer to this to this to this. You can write left to right and read it out. It's not hard to do, right? It's not hard mm. to design a language so that that's done. But somehow that's not what we have. I'd love to I'd love to change that. And specifically, you would like to read it left to right, not right to left. I'm just uh, making a east coast, east const, west const. Kind of, uh. <laughs> I, I'm actually an e- I'm an east conster mostly, but const expert threw a wrench in that. Um, but uh, but but yeah, I would make it left to right if I had a, ch- a choice. Okay. Um, uh, another thing would be I would uh, arrays would be value types instead of that weird in between thing that we have. Right. Um, yeah. There's, but you know, there's all of these things you you only get through through engineering and being successful. Right. We we have to live with the mistakes we made. Vector bool is another one thing that I'd like to fix. <laughs> That's like the butt of every joke in C plus <laughs> plus. And of course, there's vector of bool. <laughs> well, we, we we have tons of those things. Right. It's because we're successful. We've experimented, and most of our experiments are great. A few fail. Right. Uh, and a few don't really fail. They just they, they they have some quirks that we have to learn to live with. Okay. Well, it was great having you on the show today, David. Well, thanks for having me. I had a great time. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. yeah. And great to meet you guys. Never never met you before. We should we should meet <laughs> somewhere in some conference someday. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much for listening in as we chat about C plus plus. We'd love to hear what you think of the podcast. Please let us know if we're discussing the stuff you're interested in, or if you have a suggestion for a topic, we'd love to hear about that too. You can email all your thoughts to feedback at cppcast.com. We'd also appreciate if you can like cppcast on Facebook and follow cppcast on Twitter. You can also follow me at Rob W. Irving and Jason at Left to Kiss on Twitter. We'd also like to thank all our patrons who help support the show through Patreon. If you'd like to support us on Patreon, you can do so at patreon.com slash cppcast. And of course, you can find all that info and the show notes on the podcast website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode was provided by podcastthemes.com at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode was provided by podcastthemes.com.